You see, whenever God has a plan, the devil works in the darkness trying to thwart it. Where there is Jesus Christ, the devil has the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist working. Where God had a plan for mankind in the Garden of Eden, here came the serpent to work in opposition. So you see, at times, some people have to be removed from our lives because they are being used by the devil. But you see, God always wins. God's will will always prevail. So regardless of what the devil plots and plans, God's divine plan for our lives is what will prevail. For someone who's in a toxic relationship, you'll find that they are so consumed by the drama in their life that they can't focus their energy anywhere else, let alone prayer. A toxic person in your life can also influence you to do evil. The Apostle Paul wrote, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company often brings trouble. So the Lord, in His wisdom, in His love and mercy, the Lord will remove someone that we might not even realize is dragging us down. Let's say you had a car and something wasn't quite right with it. You would take it to a mechanic so that he could look over it. Well, the Lord looks over us. The Lord looks over our lives and sees all of the problems that some people cause in our lives. And the best remedy at times is for Him to remove them. All in all, we need to trust God. The Lord has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. And for us as His children, we need to trust Him because He is in control and He knows what He is doing. He allows both good and bad things to take place for the fulfillment of His divine plan. Jim Rohn is credited with saying, you become the average of your five best friends. It has also been said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. While there is some variable to how much we become the people around us, the truth is the friends and family we choose to surround ourselves with make a huge impact on our lives. Their attitudes and lifestyles rub off on us, and ours rub off on them. That is why it's crucial to beware of the people we surround ourselves with. We have to have good company, so the lifestyle of some does not rub off on us and discourage and hinder our faith. There are instances where God has to remove someone from your life so that He can enlarge your territory. A story is told of a pastor who had been called to take over a small congregation. This was a church that had less than a hundred members, but when he got there, he encountered great difficulty. A lot of people were difficult to work with. A lot of people were fighting him as he tried to do the work of God. And so this pastor and his wife prayed and fasted, asking the Lord for direction. Now the Lord opened his eyes and spoke to his heart, and it came to light that there was a lot of division in and among the members of this church. But there was a core group that stirred up a lot of the division in that church. Now, the pastor worked hard and through prayer, this group of about 20 members left one by one as they didn't agree with the changes that the pastor was enforcing. After that core group left, the congregation was even smaller. It nearly halved. But with those that remained, there was a sweet spirit that began to cover that church. Those that were left were united. They became a church that prayed together, a church that loved one another, but more importantly, they became a church that genuinely sought after the presence of God. Within a year, the church grew to from just about 50 members to over 300. That congregation continued to grow until they had over a thousand members. Now, the lesson here is that some people had to go because they were hindering the work of God, and they had to leave. When it looked like the church was losing, it looked like the church was shrinking, but God was in fact working to uproot the weeds that were hindering His church. How about in our lives? Who are the people that God needs to subtract in your life so that He can enlarge your territory? Who are some of the people that are hindering God's work within your life? Who is it that's holding you back? Be careful that you are not holding on to people who God wants to subtract from your life. 
Paul the Apostle warned the church in Corinth to beware of particular groups of people. They took that as a rule to not associate with anyone who has sin in their life. Paul responded by saying in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. He tells us that if we want to only associate with those with no sin, we would have to go to a different planet. As well, we would not be able to associate with ourselves as we have sin. In the Bible, we see that Jesus was often seen with the sinners, the outcasts, the prostitutes, and tax collectors. He was often around those who were seen as the bottom of society. Although we're supposed to be aware of certain groups of people, that does not mean we never associate with them. It means we put our guards up so their sinful lifestyle does not rub off on us. The first person we need to look out for is the skeptic. You can identify this type of person by their speech. They may say, yes, they believe, but will often add a but to the end of their sentence. For example, they'll say things like, I believe in God, but that could have been a coincidence. Or they'll say something like, I believe God can heal you, but maybe your body healed because you started eating differently. You see, with this type of person, you want to acknowledge and praise God, but they will not join you in this. They want you to question God. Instead of pointing to the hand of God, they will tell you it was just science or coincidence that something happened. The next group to be aware of is the dividers, those that love to cause division and often wear it as a badge of honor. Romans 16, verse 17 to 18 speaks directly to this type of person. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. According to the Book of Romans, the heart behind the divider is wrong. They are feeding their own evil desire. They want people to fight with each other. As they do, they can trick those who are weaker into being influenced to their side. It gives them the power and control they want. If you find someone who is constantly causing fights, beware of them as they do not have your best interests at heart. The third group to be aware of are those who are proud and arrogant. These people often make you think that you don't need God. They try to get you to trust in your own resources and wealth. Instead of giving credit to God, they point back to their own personal talents and work ethic. What these people don't realize is that God is the one who has given them the wealth and resources. While they may have worked hard for those things, God is ultimately the one who gave them the ability and desire to work hard. The Bible has much to say about pride and arrogance. It says in Proverbs 16, verse 5, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. The Lord sees the pride and arrogance of this type of people. He promises to one day judge their sin. We should beware of these people, so their pride does not rub off on us. Instead of surrounding ourselves with people who are skeptical, dividers, and proud, we should surround ourselves with people who are godly. If we become the average of our top five friends, imagine what we would become if we surround ourselves with five people who love the Lord deeply. 1 Timothy 6 verse 11 says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Paul here is writing a letter directly to Timothy. That's why he calls him a man of God. However, what Paul says applies to both men and women. We should surround ourselves with people who are pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. As they pursue those things, so will we. The question becomes for you, who am I surrounding myself with? 
Who you surround yourself with becomes who you become. If you surround yourself with people with poor attitudes about God, it's very easy to adapt those attitudes for yourself. However, if you surround yourself with people who point to God, you will also. If you surround yourself with people who have poor habits, such as not reading the Word and lacking a prayer life, you will adopt those habits as well. But if you surround yourself with people who read the Word daily and pray often, you will as well. One bad apple can spoil the rest. However, a bunch of good apples protects each other from spoiling. One of the best ways to set yourself up for a godly life is surrounding yourself with others who are living a godly life. God can remove people from your life because He wants you to grow, because He wants you to flourish in Him. Now, moving on, God can and often does remove people from our lives in order to fulfill His plan. When we give our lives to God, we are giving Him permission to do His will in our lives. Therefore, anything or anyone that comes in the way of fulfilling God's plan in your life, He will remove. God can see down the corridors of time, but more accurately, God has already been to the end and the beginning and knows every single thing that's going to happen in your life. So, beloved, I want to stand with you today and tell you to keep the faith. Whether or not you're still waiting for your prayer request to be answered, keep the faith. If the people who are closest to you have left you feeling abandoned and alone. Just keep the faith. Keep the faith that Jesus Christ will take the pain away. He will remove those feelings of loneliness. Jesus Christ is and will be all that you could ever need and more than you could ever want. If you feel like you're drowning under the weight of your sin, cry out to the Lord for deliverance and keep the faith that he will hear you. Understand that the Lord is merciful indeed. He is faithful and righteous, and I love that he is always good. He is always faithful. He understands our pain, and he wants to lift our burdens. When I think of Jesus Christ walking on water, I get excited because logically, it doesn't make sense. Scientifically, it doesn't make sense. The Bible says in Matthew 14, verse 26 to 27, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus walking on water is an act of defiance. It's him saying that the laws of nature apply to you as humans, but they don't apply to me as God. Jesus walking on water is him saying physics are a boundary for you, but the laws of physics don't apply to me. Gravity may limit you, but gravity has no impact on me. Saints, what I'm trying to tell you is that nothing is impossible for Jesus. Nothing is incurable for Jesus. Nothing is out of reach for Jesus. And I pray that this word would inspire you when you're in the middle of a tough situation. It can be hard to see beyond the present, but I want to encourage you to step out in faith. Reach out for the hand of Jesus Christ and he will deliver you. When you find that there is darkness all around you and you find it difficult to smile, you find it difficult to be happy, reach out for the hand of the one who walks on water and he will save you. And this message is for the ears of someone who really is going through difficult circumstances. Maybe you're in a dry season and you find yourself on unstable ground. Well, saints, where we're limited, the Lord is limitless. 
where we see challenges, the Lord sees opportunities. Opportunities for him to demonstrate his love for you. Opportunities for him to demonstrate his might and power to you. For years, Joshua watched as his people turned away to worship other gods. They were captivated by what the world had to offer. But Joshua refused to conform. He made the choice to follow God when no one else around him was. Joshua was willing to go against the grain to even become an outcast in order to remain obedient to God. That's the kind of dedication and perseverance we are called to have as followers of Christ. Do whatever it takes, even if it means being mocked and ridiculed. Do whatever it takes even if it means suffering and being considered an outcast. Because although the cost is great, the reward is even greater. There is no greater cause for which to give your life than Jesus Christ. Count the cost and you will see that what you gain is worth far more than anything you could give up. Jesus gives you a joy that doesn't depend on your circumstances. He gives you love like you've never known. He gives your life purpose and meaning. But most importantly, he gives you an eternity of glory that will outlast any wealth or fame you could ever have on this earth. That's the reward that awaits us if we take up our cross and do whatever it takes to follow him.